Howdy. Welcome back to the shop. Thank you so much for joining me again. Um, I really appreciate you being here and uh, chatting pipes with me. Kind of my kind of my thing. So I hope you all are doing well. Had a good Easter or whatever holiday you choose to celebrate. And uh, getting back into the work week here, and I thought. Since last week we talked about the interplay between pipe makers, pipe collectors, and retailers, that we would kind of continue on the topic of market stuff. And so I got a, actually was going to tackle two questions this week, and this is the third take, and I, I really couldn't squeeze the two questions in to a reasonable amount of time, so I'm just going to do one. And we're going to talk a little bit about kind of the rise and fall of the affordable or secondary line of pipes from people like me. I did one that is now gone. Um, yeah. So a few years ago, and by a few years ago I mean probably around 2010, two th and maybe even a little bit before, that's when I started pi making pipes, but there was there's been this continual steady rise of pipe makers who are entering the space, who are starting to make pipes and kind of posting about it and being public about it. And so I think a lot of that was private before and it migrated onto the public spaces like Facebook and Instagram. And so it kind of gave the perception that this was a really a much bigger deal than it was. Um, and it also appeared as though the people who were very new and selling, you know, beginner quality work, which is fine, uh, but it appeared that they were doing really well because you keep seeing successes. People don't post failures on Instagram, they post successes. So it, gave, it really gave the appearance of this big wave of pipe makers who were coming in and doing beginner level work and just, it's, it's out there. I think one of the things that, and this, it really became apparent about 2013, I believe. That was really when you started to see the real beginnings of it. But it had, it's this big wave, and it, it's crested. And what pipe makers started to think about, especially the people who were not doing beginner work, which I started not to be doing, you know, around that time and I started to enter my journeyman phase. Um, I, I and other pipe makers, especially people who were a little above me on the, the price and quality, were really thinking hard about what was going on here. Um, all the, the retailers were thinking hard about it. Everybody who was in the market was thinking hard about it. And I think one thing that we missed was that there wasn't so much a huge increase in demand for pipes. There was, but that these social media platforms were making it appear as though it was this huge explosive thing when in fact it was a modest boom, a very modest boom, which is continuing. That's The modest boom is not going away. I think we're seeing more and more people get into pipes, and it's great. But a lot of those early pipe makers are gone, or have kind of faded away because it appeared as though everybody was doing gangbusters and making loads of money. But it only appeared that way and once you get into the pipe market you understand that it's actually quite difficult to scratch out a living. And so I think a lot of that was flushed away from the market. Um, and we don't see that anymore. But on top of that rise of new pipe makers the older, more established pipe makers and a lot of people in the market thought that there was a really huge boom in demand. And so for me and John, my partner from J&J, &J, we saw the same thing that everybody else saw and we decided that we needed to be in that space. So there's a few points I'll hit here and then we'll call it good. It doesn't do any favors for your brand because when you start putting time and energy into a line of secondary or more affordable pipes, 
it says something about your larger brand, your high-end brand. It says that you have enough time to take away from it and that you need the money that you're going to get from the secondary brand. So you're not getting enough money from your high-end brand. And what does that say about your place in the market? So that's a complicated thought, but people unconsciously make inferences about your brand and you and your work based on what they see. And if they see that you're doing something else to try and supplement your income, even if it's unconscious, they'll start to wonder about what's going on with your pipe making career. Just, and so I, I think that's part of it. It just it doesn't do do any favors for the people who do it. It didn't do any favors for me, um, and I, we were fortunate enough to kind of back away from that that project soon enough. The other, the next point is that Briarworks really just came in and crushed everybody. It was awesome, you know. Like, I'm a, I'm an economist at heart. I, I went to school for economics, and you know, big, big capitalism fan, I guess. But so it's kind of fun for me to see these market forces at play. But man, Briarworks really brutalized everybody, and it was it was pretty smashing. They scale. It didn't take them nearly as long to get off the ground, and into this kind of market, market dominant space. So they just there's no room for anybody else to do that because they've dominated that price range with really high quality work. What are you gonna do? And the last point is that the under two hundred dollar pipe market is so enormous. You know, I sell say I plunk a thousand dollar pipe down on the table I'm competing with like maybe 50 people in the world maybe more but when you plunk a hundred and fifty dollar pipe down there are thousands perhaps millions of people who would buy that pipe probably not millions but there are a lot of people and there are a lot of options for those people you have a huge competitive landscape there are old established brands, there are antiques, there are estates, there are just so many pipes that you can buy for under $200. So you've got to have an edge. So that's a really difficult thing to create. And that's why some people go away and some people stay. And I'm, I'm not saying anything about the quality of the pipes and because our Sierra line was really, really great. They smoke well. Um, they're designed just like a high-end pipe is and finish just like that. But that wasn't enough. It's not enough to be good. We needed to be excellent and we needed to scale. And we needed to compete on the price range and we needed to build market share. And you know, there's so many things that go into having a successful brand like that. So hopefully that's food for thought. If you haven't thought about this kind of stuff before, um, you can keep on not thinking about it if you want to, but it's kind of fun in advance of a show to kind of look for these market trends and kind of guess what's going on. So, I don't know. That's that's sometimes what I spend my my time doing while I'm while I'm in the shop. Um, so, next week, next week, we will talk about uh, how pipe makers prep for shows. Um, so Alex asked this week's question. We'll get to next week's question, and I'll do a little show and tell as well. So you can see what I'm working on. Um, it's The show is coming. So I'll see you all next week. Thank you so much for being here with me and uh, listening to me gab. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please contact me, email me, or leave a comment down below. And uh, we'll talk soon. Bye. Close to sundown